this week on the Back Table Podcast. You should be agnostic about the technology. You shouldn't care at all. And if you need to throw your entire technology out the window to come up with something better, that's completely fine because your success was never tied to your tech. It was always tied to solving the market need. So that gives you a lot of freedom. The other way that I snap people out of this sometimes is I remind them that you could be right about what you're right about, but wrong about what you're wrong about. So you could give me all of these great reasons why your tech does exactly what you say it's going to do. And I'm not trying to have that conversation with you. I'm having the conversation about even if you're right about your tech, it might still not work. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and of course on backtable.com. This is Brian Hartley, your host this week. I'm a radiologist living in Nashville and co-founder of an early stage device company in the imaging space. I'm very excited to introduce our next guest on the show, Dr. Chris Kinsella, aka Topher. Topher is an author, general surgeon, and entrepreneur. His early days of entrepreneurship were centered around developing lifelike simulation dolls for medical training. He's now the CEO of an early stage drug device combo blattery drug delivery platform, it's a mouthful, called Watershed Therapeutics that has some exciting early results. He's also an author of Hidden Wombat, which he will elaborate on, I really hope. He's also an expert on building custom Halloween costumes, so I can't wait to hear what's in store this year. Finally, he's a great friend of mine, which in my humble opinion is his biggest claim to fame. With that, Topher, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Brian. Awesome. So great to have you. Always like to start out. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of background, what's your role now. Love to hear it. I I usually start by saying I'm a St. Louisan, born and raised, dot, 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 became a trauma surgeon, married a California girl. You left out a lot there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Married a California girl, moved the family out to California, did a very interesting innovation fellowship with you as a classmate and then stumbled my way into becoming the CEO of Watershed Therapeutics, which is a drug delivery company. Sweet. Are you practicing now? Any surgery, any medicine at all? Or is this is this full-time CEO? I attempted to wear all of the hats for a while, but had to hang up my scalpel about a year and a half ago. All right, cool. So let's go to the early days for just a few minutes so people get a, an idea of kind of your medical career and how you got into entrepreneurship. So Start off, how'd you choose general surgery? And then how did you get into entrepreneurship after that? Or during that, I guess I should say. In our medical school, the dean at the time gave our class a really good piece of advice. He said, don't get intellectually wrapped into what you think you should do. Look at all of the residencies. Look at where your people are. And if you really like the people that happen to be in that field, that's probably what you should do. I followed that and that led me immediately to general surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could not agree more. It was the same thing for me. And that's weird to say when I got into radiology, I was like, these are my people. (laughs) Never would I ever have like, I don't even know what that means, but it was true. You kind of just know. But if you'd asked me in med school, if somebody, my best friend at the time told me, he's like, yeah, you seem like a radiologist. I was like, what is wrong with you? You know, like that's like an insult, you know, but it's totally true. They would, you go hang out with the folks who do radiology. I was like, yep, you're my people. So yeah, couldn't agree more. The other side of that story is that I met my wife because she was interested in becoming a surgeon. And once I shared that piece of advice with her, she decided that she did not want to be a general surgeon at all, but wanted to be an emergency <laughs> medicine doc. And I don't know what that means for our marriage. Yeah. But. It's because she met you, right? <laughs> She's like, you're a general surgeon. Oh no. Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. So when did you start? uh, When did you know, I guess, you know, know, or when did you get involved with entrepreneurship and basically improving things in healthcare, right? That's generally where most people start. They're like, there is a problem and I must fix it, right? Yeah. I've always been interested in problems you can't buy your way out of. So when I was training as a surgeon, there's this beautiful operation called a carotid endarterectomy, super high stakes, It's so elegant and uh, changes people's lives. So lots of surgeons fall in love with it. And for a while, I thought I was going to be a vascular surgeon. The problem is that it's so high stakes. Yeah, strokes. No attending surgeon really feels comfortable letting you do it as a resident. You know, because if you you mess it up, that's a problem. Yeah, patient has a stroke. Brain's pretty important stuff. So what I wanted was I looked for 
a surgical trainer that would allow me to master all of the steps, both technical and, and planning wise, so that when I showed up in the operating room, it would be clear that I was there as a serious participant. And when I went online, I could not buy my way out of my problem. There were no surgical trainers that were anything close to what I wanted. They, you could buy something that had fake skin over a fake blood vessel. So you could go through the, the act of cutting skin and then open it up and then the vessel's right there. But that surgery, just like every surgery, is 99% what you don't do. Every structure you don't injure. Yeah. Yeah. Everything you have to protect. I mean, for God's sakes, everybody's watched a surgeon who has beautiful exposures and one that doesn't. It's the difference between can the intern do the case versus does it need to be a fellow with an assist? And there were no surgical trainers made like that. None. So I had to build it myself so that I could train on it. And is this like a mannequin? I mean, we say trainer, describe to me what you're talking about. Yeah. So I, I got really involved in elaborate Halloween costumes. <laughs> oh, right. Great segue. Yeah, well, it turns out that a knowledge of anatomy is really helpful in making accurate Halloween costumes. And so these things sort of played off each other back and forth. And so I used glue and plastic bottles and latex tubes and felt to reconstruct a human neck. And, you know, made of all the same materials as my Halloween costumes, but it was good enough to practice on. And it was good enough to take people through the surgery. So you built this thing and you practiced on it. And when did you find out like, hey, maybe other people would want to use these and could you sell them? The next thing that happened was I started training other residents on it and it was lifelike enough that people started to sweat. You know, you could, you could drape it as if it was a surgery. And I didn't really take that much farther because I had solved my immediate problem. But then during my trauma rotation, I saw an ED thoracotomy, which, you know, for your listeners, if they're not entirely familiar with that, the easy version of this is that there's some catastrophic injury to your, your aorta. You're bleeding faster than we can get you to the operating room. So the solution is to cut your chest wide open, reach inside, grab the aorta, and clamp it above the injury. And this is in the, in the ED, not even in, in like the, an operating room. Yeah, in the emergency department. So now you start dying a different way, but it's slower. So now we can get you to the, to the, to the OR. And the survival rate of this is terrible and it's really chaotic. It's actually dangerous for the people that do it. It doesn't make you feel very good. Somebody invented a really clever solution around that. This company called Pritime Medical, they had a, uh, they had a balloon on a catheter. You would poke someone in the groin, you would feed the catheter up above the hole and then inflate a balloon. So instead of clamping from the outside, you're clamping from the inside. Really elegant, really clever. I was in love with this thing. Is this the Reboa? This is Reboa, R-E-B-O-A, for resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of aorta. And so I went to our trauma doctors and I said, I want to do Reboa. I think we should do that at our hospital. And they said, that sounds great. And what year were you? Or what were you? What level Fourth of Fourth year resident, I think. And they said, that sounds great. We're never doing that. And I was shocked. Why? He said, listen. I haven't been trained on it. And in an emergency, I'm not going to go to something I've never seen and I've never practiced. It's like, okay. So I looked and said, how do I get this for my facility so I can do this procedure? And it turns out at the time, there was only one place you could train to get proficient. And that was at Maryland Shock Trauma. They had a course. It was once a month, maybe. And I think they had a carrying capacity of 20 people because they were doing it on cadavers. And you know, I did some quick math for the number of trauma surgeons in the country and the opportunity cost to take off work and fly over to Maryland Shock Trauma and do the course and everything. And this was never going to work. So I went to the website of the company and they had a contact form. And so I, I just filled out that little contact form and said, you guys have a huge problem. I want to use your product and I can't. You guys need a surgical trainer. And my phone rang within 10 minutes. It was the CEO of that company who I'm still friends with today. And he said, who the hell are you? <laughs> and so we got to talking and he said, I believe you. I believe we need a surgical trainer. Can you make one? And in that moment, I told a very important lie. I said that I could. And he said, okay, email me back when you're done. <laughs> 
Yeah. So I, um, I said I could do it. And so I canceled my plans for that. I was so excited. Canceled my plans for that weekend, went to Home Depot, bought a $5 Homer bucket and started to carve and used everything I had learned from making the surgical trainers before to make a human torso with a groin with tubing that you could cannulate and whose life you could save. And I was very proud of it. I sent him photographs of it. He said, Topher, this looks pretty amateurish, <laughs> but I like where you're going. It's the vision, the, right? You generated yeah. a prototype, basically. Is what exactly. And, and it contained all the elements that you need as an operator, which is not, a th again, it goes back to the- It's not for sales, right? This is for just get it done. Exactly. And he said, can you do a better job of that? Can you make it look like it's commercial? And I said, uh, yeah, I think I can. And so I went back to the drawing board, decided I was going to get a credit card for this effort, went into a couple thousand dollars worth of debt making it, but came back with a, a really slick looking version of the product. And that ended up becoming my first company. Awesome. So hold on. So did you have this company with this guy or, or with the CEO? Or are you like, this is, the, you know, I'm now going to sell this. It's like, how did, how did that work out? No, he was in the catheter making business. He wasn't in the surgical trainer making business. And I think as a CEO, he saw me maybe as a free resource. Like he doesn't have to pay me anything. I'm doing this. I'm taking all of the financial risk, all the time risk myself. And so I made this and I brought it to Maryland Shock Trauma and they used it for training there. I brought it to the American College of Surgeons. They used it for training there. He helped me get entree into all of these rooms. Um, How many did you sell early on or total, I guess? I mean, oh, I went so foolishly, but I went $60,000 into the hole to do this, which sounds insane out loud. But at the moment, you know, you're just a frog boiling in water. It's fine. Yeah. Ended up breaking even within six months. Wow, that is so impressive. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. And I think that was because there was a real need for it. People really believed in this approach. They believed in the product. They just didn't feel comfortable. They needed to feel comfortable. That is awesome. I, I love that. And then at this point, is this when you decided to go to Stanford to do the biodesign program because you wanted to take it to the next level or what? My wife decided that. I was, at the time, I thought I was going to become a vascular surgeon. And my wife, her father's also an entrepreneur. And so she grew up in a household with somebody like that. And whether that was why she married me or she just recognized it after the fact, you know, she's, she thought we had the same phenotype. And so she just skipped to the end and she said, look, I've never seen you so fired up about anything as trying to solve this problem. What if instead of becoming a vascular surgeon and never seeing me or your kids, you went into business making medical products. And that's when I started looking at programs around the country that do biodesign. And that's what led me to Stanford. Awesome. At biodesign, what do you think, you know, within five minutes, a couple minutes, can you just say, what were the takeaways from, from biodesign that you think other folks should know? I know we've had an episode, we had Todd uh, Brenton on, We've talked about biodesign before, but just in your mind, what do you think biodesign did that was super helpful? The most important thing you learn at Stanford. So they tell you, don't come with any ideas for a company you want to start. And then everybody does that. Everybody has their idea for how they're going to become super rich. They're just using Stanford as a springboard <laughs> and you, you, you get there and you learn two things that are so important that they changed my life. And I think that they're going to change the lives of every patient downstream of everybody that goes there. The first is that if you have an unmet market, if there's a lot of people who have a problem, especially if they can't buy their way out of it, those people aren't going anywhere. So if you really pay attention to what it is that they want and you solve it, you will be successful. You just have to really get religion around identifying who's hurting. The second thing, and it's paired with that, is inventing is the easy part. You know, everybody thinks that these ideas get born out of some genius mind, fully formed, delivered into the world. And it's completely incorrect and it's backwards. If you, if you meet your unmet market and you really do your research and find out what they need, the constraints that they place on you are so tight that there's really only one or two things you could ever invent and they told you what to do. 
It's like that saying, a well-asked question is half answered. It's the exact same thing. If you know the market perfectly, they're already telling you what to invent. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more in the sense that you know that if you understand the problem well enough, the solution almost jumps out at you. You know, you're almost like this is, there's only really one or, as you said, one or two ways to solve it. And I couldn't agree more. It really, how many times, and let's, let's talk about this. How many times did we go into those brainstorming rooms during the invention phase? So for those listening, there's three phases. There is identify the clinical need. That to me is the most important part by far is identifying the need, vetting it, do the math, market, all of it. And then there's inventing where you go into caffeine and candy fuel, you know, hazy in, in, you know, brainstorming with hundreds of ideas and all that. And then there's implementing. So that inventing to me, how many times did we go into that room and just throw out random, the most, what did we talk about? What would you always say? Like whenever you said lasers or magnets, you knew you were kind of like, it, you've reached the end of your road. But how many good ideas actually came from that brainstorming? I'm just kind of, this is my, my kind of idea that I just say the brainstorming part is almost kind of self-serving a little bit. Because I didn't notice many good ideas at all come out of those brainstorming rooms. Maybe you think differently, but that's what I thought. I thought generally the idea popped when you when you understood the market and you had insight. It was obvious. You didn't need a brainstorming. I think about the brainstorming now as stretching. The most useful thing that came out of the brainstorm is when someone would come up with an idea that you had not thought of. It didn't have to be useful. The information was that you hadn't thought of it. And so that told you where you had some limiting constraint or some assumption and gave you the idea to start questioning it. Why is my assumption there? Why didn't I think about that thing? And to me, it just like stretching, it just clears out all the soreness. It clears out the restriction. It clears out the acid. You're right. Ultimately, if you really knew your market, you knew your criteria, it was so constricting that the answer did just kind of come at that point. You didn't have to brainstorm too much. Brainstorming is a bit of a warm up. You know, it definitely just kind of, I mean, it was fun. You, you thought you, you were challenged to think laterally in, in different ways, but how many true ideas that went on to be patents that went on to be sold ended up being invented in that room? I would say, I don't know, but did it get you thinking differently? Yeah, probably. So we don't get to run the experiment again where you do by design without it. Here, <laughs> the randomized control I, trial. Yeah. But here's what I would say. Daniel's son was pissed at Miyagi for making him paint the fence. <laughs> but he was learning a skill that he didn't know he was learning. And to me, that is what biodesign was doing with us with the brainstorming. Yeah. I, it, it's very possible. You, you, you very, very possibly could be right. I know the process is sacred. So, you know, you got to trust the process to some degree, but that was my takeaway is like, we talk about the most ridiculous things in there. You know, it'd be like, what if you use, you know, no gravity? What if we built an anti-gravity chamber? And, you know, if we had a perpetual motion machine, it would, you know, it would work. So anyway, but I, I it's all part of the process. I totally agree. And to be honest, sometimes it's just about the buy-in. You work so damn hard while you're there, you don't even realize how hard you'd be working about design. But if you remember those first like three months, we were all working until like 10 late at night thinking we were going from medicine to kind of an easy uh, stretch and we'd be working all the time. You know, we'd be doing a presentation every, remember it would be every day we gave a pitch. Every single day you would have to update what you did and give a pitch during the identify phase. So it's such a it, it was so interesting going through the process. It was such a buy-in so much that by the end of it, you're like, well, I got to start a company. I've done so much work already. I need to take this through. You know, I do think about the work that went into that program. I'll just say I'm incredibly grateful for it. One of the things that I struggled with, though, is that I left surgical residency and really feeling like you had climbed to the top of a relative hierarchy. And then you go into that program and you realize you are starting over not even as an intern, as a medical student. And that is a huge shock to the system. You have to completely start over at zero and climb a new sort of S-curve of competency. And, uh, you know, for most surgeons who would try this, you're in your mid to late 30s at this point. That's a big lift to do that again. And uh, I would just let everybody know that that's what they're in for if they want to do it. There's no doubt about it. 
you're definitely rebuilding the way you think. So anyway, it was a great experience, at least for me, uh, learned a ton from it. So got your points out of there. So tell us after biodesign, you started a company. Well, let me, let's say, did you have a company coming out of biodesign through biodesign and how did you get to watershed, which is separate from biodesign? Well, out of biodesign, they encourage you, if you have a good idea to try to pursue it a little bit on your own. And we had a idea that was around the unmet need of really bad thoracic pain after surgery. You know, pain control is famously very difficult for surgical patients. And if you have bad pain control, your intestines don't work, you don't breathe fully, you get pneumonia. There's lots of downstream complications. And so we had a clever solution for it. And the reason our solution or the reason we had an unmet need was because the existing solution, which was long acting local anesthetic, uh, Xperel, was priced really high. It was priced appropriately for its value, but it was priced very high. So anyway, we go into this development, we prove a couple of things in animals, and then we go do our IP diligence. And it turns out that Xperl's patents are going to expire in three years. That killed the company. And that was really, that was a really useful experience for us because the unmet need, the reason the market was there was because there were people that could not afford an existing solution. But once the IP expired, generics were going to flood the market. The price was going to come down. Our unmet need was going to evaporate. So we would be just in time to have wasted all of our time. And so seeing that down the, down the road, we just decided to fold it up and we actually gave back the money that we had been given to pursue the idea. And I'm told that we are the first team to have ever done that. And we earned a lot of goodwill with those investors for doing that. So tell me, you've said this a bunch to me when we've had our, our conversations. You're unique in this because it's, uh, it's definitely kind of taking the other side of the equation. You are always looking to find ways to kill an idea or kill a company early on, right? You know, which a lot, most people, their bias is when you go in, you, you come up with an idea, you're like, this is a great idea. I'm a genius. Good Lord. Let, let's, let's rock this thing and go all the way, uh, you know, to exit. You take the opposite tack. You, you love the idea, but at the same time, you're like, you've got to learn to stand on your own idea. And you make sure that it stands the test of time before you actually put a ton of work into it. So talk about that just a little bit, because I think it is a bit of, it's counterintuitive. I will say that a super valuable thing to me after I left biodesign, biodesign's great on the inventor side of things. What I was missing in my education was what do investors think? I didn't have the reps. I wanted to sit on the other side of the investor table and see lots of companies come by so that I could pick up their rubric for how to immediately spot something that had promise versus something that didn't. I learned a ton during that experience, but one of the things that struck me amongst the best investors was that they didn't try to be right. They tried to weigh their risk and decide which risks they would pay for and which ones they were not willing to pay for. So if you have an idea and it starts with a really brilliant technical solution, I can look at that and I can say, well, I think the risk that you're technically going to be able to do the thing that you say you can is probably pretty low. You seem like a really smart guy. Is that where I think the risk in the company is hiding though? The risk might be hiding in the fact that you've never done this before, that it would take too much money to get to market, that the margins on a product that you delivered would be too small that the value that it's that delivered is uh, too little or that the competitive space is too crowded. I mean, there's, there's like 13 different dimensions you can look at a thing. So I would run the list and I would ask people about it. And if they hadn't thought of it and I had, that was usually a red flag, but it could also be an opportunity. You know, what, a, what an easy way to make a company more valuable than to surface an unrealized risk and retire it. And then you just look at, you look at these risks and you just say to yourself, how much capital do I have to put in play before I can retire those risks? And if that is uh, an exposure you could tolerate, go ahead. Uh, if it's not, you just say no. And I think it's important to do that as early as possible because, you know, we're all going to die one day. You probably have enough You're time. You're so positive. I love yeah, this. Yeah. This, this is, well, this is a tophorism, <laughs> folks. He, this, is, this is how he speaks in the real world. Yeah, you're, we're all going to die one day. You probably, if you're an entrepreneur, have enough time to work on, as an operator, three companies. If you start at my age, right? I'm, I'm 40. So 
if each one is going to take me 10 years and I might have to raise $100 million per each one, I cannot afford to waste your money or my time on a bad idea. So it's a, it's a service to the whole world to, to kill the, the bad ideas early and to avoid the risk that is not worthwhile. How do you kill an idea? That's so much easier with an example. I'll give you one. Someone reached out to me recently and said that they were talking to a startup that was very interested in and had good proof of concept for head transplants. Head? Head transplants. Wow. And for me, knowing what I know about transplant medicine in general, I thought that that was quite a big lift. And knowing that we have never figured out how to heal the central nervous system without glial scar blocking all communication. I thought that there was no way a head was going to get transplanted and control a body. And there were so many technological marvels that would have to be co-realized for that to work that that seemed like it just really wasn't in play. And that's not even addressing what on earth would the market for that be? How many people are there that would be interested in that? So, you know, that's an example of a really easy one. I think it's really also just wrapping your head, I guess I'm going to go pun intended here, wrapping your head around this counterintuitive thought, which is when most people think of an idea, they become wedded to it, which is another a bias that I've seen as a founder. You kind of have to be wedded to your idea. You, 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 you don't want to think of that your, your baby's ugly. And so that because it takes that energy just to move through the whole process. You better love what you're doing or it's never going to work. So it is a bit, you have to pull yourself out of your current line of thinking to explore how are you going to kill it, right? And that's, it is very counterintuitive, but oh my gosh, if people just took a week, right? Or, or less even of just being like, you know, if this were not going to work, how is it not going to work? Like you said, put yourself in a, um, investor shoes because usually an investor they're not going to give you 10 reasons why they think it won't work an investor will tell you one or two and that's it and those are generally all you need to really make a decision right and if they did that in just you know for a short period of time i think a lot of people could focus on on the right things which i guess is probably what you guys are working on in your book right well i would say that you know, there's a couple of like magical phrases that people say to you. And if you can hold them in your head, I make fewer mistakes. One of them is when you are involved in a company, especially if you're an inventor, you tend to fall in love with the solution you came up with. In our company, and this comes from Stanford's biodesign program, you do not fall in love with the technology. You fall in love with the unmet market. You fall in love with the unmet need. You should be agnostic about the technology. You shouldn't care at all. And if you need to throw your entire technology out the window to come up with something better, that's completely fine because your success was never tied to your tech. It was always tied to solving the market need. So that gives you a lot of freedom. The other way that I snap people out of this sometimes is I remind them that you could be right about what you're right about, but wrong about what you're wrong about. So you could give me all of these great reasons why your tech does exactly what you say it's going to do. And I'm not trying to have that conversation with you. I'm having the conversation about even if you're right about your tech, it might still not work. Yeah. Given if I just give this to you, like, let's say it works perfectly. Is there really a there there? Is there really a market? What have your, what are you not seeing in terms of risks of payers or reimbursement or the trend in the, in the technology in the field? Yeah. There's a pithy phrase that came out of the by design program that's that was assume invention. Yeah. <laughs> so it allows you to completely skip getting wrapped around the axle about how cool your widget is. Just says, yeah, assume all of it works exactly as you say it does. Now what? Great. It really makes you move up to the next higher plane of, of value building. And that was always, you know, who was it? Jay Jay Watkins, right? Who came in to talk to us about value. Yeah, Jay Watkins was the uh Bed tech incarnation of Frank Abagnale, sell me this pen. Yeah, you mean Wolf of Wall Street, sell me this pen. Yeah, I guess I do. You're yeah, right. yeah, same actor, but yeah, totally. That's exactly what it was. He was so good at that. All right, sweet. And then, so you went through biodesign, you killed the biodesign actually originated company, 
and you're looking for a new one. Tell me, tell me how that came about and you met your, your co-founder Clay, correct? Yeah. Well, one of the things that scares people about leaving medicine or going to Stanford's uh, program or then leaving the program is, uh, what am I going to do about my deal flow? It's also why people move out to Silicon Valley. It's this idea that I want to be exposed to lots of opportunities. So that area of the company of the country is the best place for that. But within that ecosystem, how do you, how do you maximize your chances? And so I went to work with an investment group where I would regularly just help them for free research all of the companies that came through. So it was mutual benefit. I learned about investing. They got to learn about medicine and, and so forth. I was at a conference and there was a social event afterwards and I dropped my name tag on the ground and then a guy picked it up and said, is this yours? And he was a really smiley gentleman. And so I started talking to him and it turns out he had started a company to solve a problem I had identified as a surgeon, which was putting a breathing tube in the food tube. So someone's dying, they can't breathe for themselves. You try to artificially ventilate them and instead you inflate their stomach and they die. So it sounds like a mistake you shouldn't make. It gets made all the time. So I had a post-it note on my desk that I was going to solve this problem one day. And I meet this guy and he's already solved it. And he's really far ahead. And so I knew that I liked him immediately. And he and I started talking and he learned that I had done some consulting in neurology. I was a surgeon. I had this background. And he pitched me this other idea of his. And the way that idea came to him was that he was a paramedic. And he kept getting called to nursing homes to pick up women who were really ill. No one was sure why bring them to the emergency department. And time and time again, it was because they had a UTI and that was causing them to have sepsis and, you know, their brain was altered. And he thought that was pretty interesting, but then he kept getting called to bring the same women from the nursing home to the ER month after month after month. And then he got pissed off. And he talked to the doctors and said, why can't, if you know who's going to have the problem, why can't you stop it? And they said, we can't. The best solution is they take antibiotics every day for the rest of their life. They don't want to do that. The side effects are terrible. And a lot of them can't remember to do it. So this is just their reality. And so again, on a post-it note, he writes a problem that he's going to solve. And then one day he's sitting in a friend's jacuzzi and he sees this plastic ball floating in the water. And he says, what's that? They say, oh, you know, it's got a little chlorine in it. It releases it into the jacuzzi so that bacteria don't grow. You know, it's warm water. It's easier for them to grow. And I guess he'd had a couple of beers at that point. He was fuzzy enough that he connected those two ideas together. And he said, what if I put a floating jacuzzi ball into the bladders of women to stop them from getting UTIs? And he went home and got a piece of graph paper and wrote the provisional patent that ended up becoming the core IP to the company. So he brings this idea to me. And immediately I try to kill it and he's got a good answer for the first objection. And so I attack it from another direction and he defends again and I attack from another direction and he surprises me, tells me things I've never realized, never heard before, which is that there are companies that have put bladder drug delivery products into the bladder. Patients can have a very large object in their bladder and have it sit there comfortably and the problem's enormous. And I didn't know any of those things. And so after six weeks of trying to kill this guy's company, I failed. And, you know, my head kind of drops. I go, oh, damn it. All right. He and I decided to start the company together. And that became Watershed. You guys had been brainstorming for a while. He was already working on another company. He has this idea. You try to kill it. He likes your surgical expertise, biodesign, et cetera. You're looking for that opportunity. How did you guys decide to, how did you structure it? So that you would come in and start working on this. Was he going to be CEO? Were you going to be CEO? How does how, how did how did the team form and what issues did you run into? Oh, you know, Peter Thiel's got this book called Zero to One. And in it, he talks about how a company that is not formed with a solid base is doomed from the beginning. So, I mean, I took this process very seriously. I'd also come out of Stanford's program and they famously have teams that form of four people. And in the beginning, they say, you know, we're going to split it equally. Each of us has a quarter of the company. And then if it goes anywhere, there's usually two people that do, that actually work on the product and the other two stop and it creates a whole bunch of team problems. So I was very sensitive to this. Meanwhile, think of it, think about it from his standpoint. He's got this great idea. He knows a secret the rest of the world doesn't know, which is 
how big this market is, how desperately they want a solution and a really cool approach. And he's known me for six weeks. So how on earth do you trust a person you just met with any part of your company? So the negotiations were sensitive. We ended up coming pretty close to a, I think the smartest thing we did was we said, what are the roles in the company? You know, there's a clinical role, there's an R and D role, there's a technical development role, there's a fundraising role. What do we think each of these roles is worth from an equity standpoint? And what do we think each one of us can carry? And we signed up for the pieces we thought we could carry. And over time, if it turned out that our obligations made it so we couldn't carry that percentage, well, we had a gentleman's agreement written between us, which was that we were going to do the right thing. And we were going to give that piece of equity to the other co-founder who was going to carry it, or we'd give it to another person who we'd have to hire in who would do that. And anyway, as the company evolved, his company started doing very well. It required a lot more of his attention and we needed to bring in a specialty technology expert. And so when we hired our CTO, my co-founder gave up a significant piece of his equity to entice her to join the company. But I, I still think that was the smartest thing we could have done and the best way we could have structured a company like especially like when those sensitive things are being considered. When you say the best way to structure it, that was the best way. What did you mean exactly? Like, oh, when you're doing your equity split at the founding of a company, 50 50 is a bad idea. 80 20 seems a little bit lopsided. Ultimately, two people seem to arrive at the split arbitrarily. And if it's arbitrary, it can't be revisited, it can't be reasoned. One of the things I'm proud of that we did was that we were very reasoned from the beginning as to not that equity was owed, but that equity was earned by the roles in the company that you fulfilled. So if you were doing R&D and you were doing clinical and you were doing preclinical and you were doing fundraising, you know, you got the whole company. You don't even need a partner. But if you have to break off pieces of that, then, you know, somebody else gets 20%, somebody else gets 25%, et cetera. And so that's how we sort of split the pie. That's great. Okay. So you decided to put this structure together for the company. You've got a basic idea. Where do you go next? You really hope you've done a good job in your life of having people trust you. You know, one of the very interesting things was that uh, my co-founder, Clay Nolan, he had done such a great job with his, with his company, Collabs. He had a lot of trust built up. And so some of his existing investors, when they heard that he had another project that he had co-founded, immediately said, how can we support you? And they wrote a check. And that was an amazing experience. I reached out to you know my friends and family and, and tried to be very honest with them and said, uh, you don't have to invest in my company. I'll find the money, but I want you to have the opportunity in case you think that's a good idea. Just know that the money is probably going to be set on fire and disappear forever. And it works best when $15,000 disappears at a time. And I had a cousin of mine who told me from a young age that if I ever started a company and he didn't get to invest, he would kill me. So I reached out to him and he wrote a check to support us. And so we had maybe 50 grand to start and we did an experiment and the experiment worked. We did another experiment. That experiment worked. Yeah. What are these uh, experiments? Are you, are you injecting stuff? Yeah. These are stupid little things like- um, A Ziploc baggie or something or- Yeah. Go to a farmer- and ask for a cow or a pig bladder before they hemisect the animal. So you have this intact organ and then you place what you think your product is gonna look like into that bladder and then see if it stays and see if it behaves the way that you want it to. And then you do that a number of times, you quantify the result and that looks good. Then you do a little bit of research on intellectual property and you file your first patent and you do a freedom to operate analysis and, and all of that looks good. And then you get urologists and other people who are experts on the market to write you letters that say, this is a huge problem. This is a pain point for us. If you had a product like this, we would use it. And so you start to piece the sort of story together from start to finish, de-risking the biggest thing as you go along. And it's like the first domino falling. I think our first check was for $15,000. We quickly got to fifty. We did the experiments, then we got to a quarter of a million. We did more experiments, then we got to a million, and then raised two million, and then four million, and so on. How much have you guys raised? 
six point something. Great. And then, so what I see is kind of this, uh, you know, it's a cascade, as you said, you piece the story together early on, you de-risk the biggest risks, and then you just start knocking them down and then you build momentum. What were some hinge points, some, some pivot points, uh, that you guys went through basically where things didn't go as planned or maybe they did, but in a different way. And what were those, maybe pick out one of those and, and, and take us through that. Well, again, this is the advantage of thinking of assume invention and think backwards. We originally thought our product was going to be a device. And when we looked at existing codes for placement of a device into the bladder or installation of a product into the bladder, the codes existed, but they reimbursed very low. It would not be worth it to bring a product to market if that's all you could charge. And that was an inescapable, it felt like an inescapable problem. And so one of the first, one of the first pivots we did was we decided we were going to be a drug company because if you're, you know, if you go to a hospital with a device, you go through this thing called a value analysis committee and they look at your product. Let's say you're an orthopedic company, you have some new plate or new screw. Well, they look at that and then they say, well, this looks like something from Home Depot. I can buy it at Home Depot for for five bucks and you're trying to charge me 400. We'll pay you 50. You know, and then and then the negotiation starts. Whereas if you go to a value analysis committee with a drug, that's a witch's brew. Like who knows how to make a drug? So you have a lot more pricing power, and you can you can you know you don't have this thing that's anchoring it to it should be worth nothing. You can actually anchor it to the value you're delivering for the patients. So there were advantages to being a drug. The disadvantage was we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't learn how to develop drugs. We didn't learn how to do a drug company. I didn't know anything about that regulatory path. I ended up going on Amazon and trying to trying to search for how do you run a drug company <laughs> and and buying those books and reading them completely unhelpful. And it was a useful experience because what you learn along the way is that you actually uh, don't need to know. You just need to know what to do next. And so long as you keep doing the thing you need to do next that goes slow enough that the future kind of fills in. You get the right people around you and you can figure it out. That's awesome. Okay, so where are you guys now? You started with pig bladders or cow bladders, and now where are you? Today we have completed two clinical trials in healthy patients with a placebo version of our product, proving that we can deliver it and that it's retained and that it's safe. And in parallel to that, we've demonstrated in the lab in a bladder model that we can release the drug over the course of several weeks out to several months at a level that would be meaningful for bladder disease. And when you say bladder disease, what market are you guys going after? And how did you choose that? Well, the interesting thing is that we uh, developed a technology to solve for chronic or recurrent urinary tract infection. We accidentally created a platform for drug delivery into the bladder that should work for any disease where you need to deliver drug into the bladder. So you can expand into overactive bladder or bladder cancer. Our reason we exist is for recurrent UTI. And so that's our lead indication, but we've explored uh, these other indications as well. All right, sweet. Are you guys raising funds right now by chance? Oh, we are. We're, uh, we've met with the FDA to understand our path forward. And we have an opportunity to get an IND and then do phase two clinical trial. So we're raising a series A for that now. Awesome. Well, all right. I'd love to ask you, you're an author as well. Give us a little intro on the book and, you know, we'll get, I, I'd love to, to bring you back and do, go and do a deep dive, but I'd love to just get a taste here on, on what that book's about. So not everybody has a year to take off from their life to go to Stanford to do their biodesign program. So there is a need for... You know, the ability to learn what you're going to learn quickly. That's what books are for. The other need was that biodesign programs really built for entrepreneurs who are going to kind of give up everything they're doing and pursue that path. But that's a different problem set. And that's a different type of person than somebody who wants to do this part-time or somebody who already has a full-time job, whether it's in corporate or whether it's in a hospital. In those cases, you need to have something that will work in pieces. And there are certain things you have to prioritize that are different than at biodesign. Chief among them is early and quick results. 
and it, it, specifically in an environment where you have different resources available. You know, you're not a startup. And so that was the impetus behind the book, which was that when we would go and try to teach the important lessons we had learned at Stanford inside of a corporate environment, you know, it's just a different rule set. So you had to, you had to tweak the program quite a bit to make it successful. And we had to do it the same way every time. And so we thought, okay, this is a recurring problem. You should probably write it down and just make it easy for people. So that was the genesis of the book. And the philosophy behind it was, again, killing things quickly. So that's why we named the book uh, Wombat. It stands for Waste of Money, Brains, and Time. And the goal of it is to remind you when you're considering an idea, it might be great tech. It might be really clever but it has to satisfy more things than just being clever or being useful. It has to be a good use of your money and your brains and your time, which means that even if people would love it, if there's another problem you could work on that's worth 10 times as much, it's a sin for you to work on this smaller problem. You need to solve the bigger one. So we thought that it was useful to give people that rubric for trying to figure out which, which opportunity they should pursue. How's it been received? Near as we can tell, great. One of the frustrating things about writing a book like that is that I don't get to talk to everybody who buys it. So I don't know what the people in Germany and Japan are doing with it, but I'd love to hear from you and uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell me why you're buying so many copies. Awesome. All right. I want to wrap up with one very important question, okay? Probably the most important question of the interview, and that is, what's Halloween look like this year in, in the Kinsella household? My children dictate that now. I used to I used to start Halloween three months in advance for some huge ornamental set piece, and now uh, it's what my kids want to do. So my son, one son is obsessed with ninjas, another son is obsessed with Star Trek. I've got a daughter who wants to go as a horse every single year, <laughs> and then I and then I have a daughter who likes to mix and match things that make no sense. So one year she wanted to be a cat princess. Oh, nice. And another year, she wanted to be a ghost, but covered with flowers. So I never know what she's going to suggest. So the horse you can reuse, but Ninja, is it, it, do you do homemade stuff or is it a lot of like store trips? Are you doing store-bought co uh, costumes or, or are you still no. using your, your homemade skills? I want them to see early on that you can that you can make things. So it's always homemade. I love it. I love that. Uh, are you going as anything this year? Do you do you trick or treat as well, or are you are you just Topher? I have some very large dinosaur heads that I've made in the past. I tend to put one of those on and walk around. Love it. Awesome. Well, uh, Topher, that is a great place to end. Thank you so much. I think we're definitely. I'm gonna we're gonna bring you back and and talk more about hidden wombat. I want to dig into that. But with this, I think it was such a great intro hearing about watershed and what you guys are doing your thoughts on biodesign. So, all right, let me let me run through my summary really fast. And then if I say something that you think needs an addendum, please just interrupt me and, and we'll go from there, okay? All right, so number one, solve problems you can't buy your way out of. I like that a lot. It means if you, if you would pay to solve that problem, then but you can't, there's an opportunity there. Surgical simulator for you for carotid endarterectomy was that first kind of light bulb moment that you couldn't buy it. Next, have a bias to action. I think I, I'm putting this one out here because that's what I see what you did. You called the CEO and you're like, hey, you need a surgical simulator. Not everybody would do that. And I think a lot of successful entrepreneurs, they have a bias to action. We learned that at Biodesign, right? Josh Mackauer would always talk about that. Just pick up the phone and do it. Don't wait. And you contacted the CEO and, and you got the ball rolling. You know, he asked you if you could build it and, and, and you said, sure, yep, totally. And you weren't sure you could do that, but you, 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 you leaned into it, so to speak. And I think taking that risk has made a big difference. Walk the plank. This is just me putting words in. You went into debt 60K, then broke even in six months. I'm not advocating for people to do anything like that. What I am saying that taking risk gives you buy-in that will help see you through when times get tough. So, you know, we both took a year off of clinical medicine to, to do biodesign. That's a big risk. Not a lot of people would do that. But what it did was show me that, and probably you, that you can take risks and you'll be okay. And you might find something at the end of that, end of that rainbow that you like even more than what you're doing at that time. So kind of put yourself in some calculated risky situations because sometimes it can be a great motivator. So what biodesign will teach you a couple things you said if you have an unmet market where they can't buy your way out right that's the number one thing you said 
you'll be successful if you solve it. And then next, inventing is the easy part. Really, once you've identified your market, you've honed in, you've put your constraints around what the solution kind of has to do and in, in what way, shape, and form and cost, oftentimes the solution will jump out at you. So if it's not jumping out at you, you probably don't understand your clinical need as well as you thought. Find your key risk early on and stress test your ideas. Try to kill it. Think like an investor. If you were acting as an investor and somebody brought you this idea, don't try to be right. You know, which, which risks are you as an investor willing to pay for and which one are you not? I, I like that. Fall in love with the need and the unmet market, not the technology. You should be able to, you should be willing to throw away your invention. It shouldn't matter. You should be able to replace it with something else if it solves the need better. As you said in biodesign, assume invention. Assume it works perfectly, right? And at that point, what's next? You know, does the market really absorb what you what you built, what you solved for, or does it not? And that's a that honestly is a is a level up understanding of device development. Next, a company not formed on a solid basis doomed immediately. You said Peter Thiel, right? team is really, really important. Getting in on solid footing at the beginning is critical. Splitting equity equally is rarely the right idea. Equity is earned, not owed. Dividing it up into chunks of work that needs to be done, not work that has been done, work that needs to be done. And then divvying it out in that way is often very reasonable. Piece the story together early on. So in your first doing it, you solved one problem at a time. I bring this up, I swear, every third podcast. It, I think of The Martian, right? You know that movie, Topher. Think of The Martian. I think of Matt Damon at the end when he's like, you solve one problem and then you solve another and then you solve another. And if you solve enough problems in a row, you get to come home. And in this case, if you solve enough problems in a row, whether it's market, tech, team, whatever, reimbursement, any, all of it, then you get to get your product to market, right? You get to you get to see it affecting multiple patients in a positive way. And I think having a big vision is important, but always keep your gaze directed towards the next problem. I'm out. What do you got? Anything else you would add to that? I think those are fantastic. The more controversial way I would say solve problems you can't buy your way out of would be if rich people don't have your problem, it's not a problem. Yes, that is controversial, and that's why I love you, Topher, because you do not shy away from controversy. Yeah, because uh, if rich people have the problem, everybody's got the problem. If only people without money have the problem, then the solution is money. Okay, I think that's actually a, a, a very interesting way of putting it. I think a lot of investors probably think that way as well. That's great. Awesome. Topher, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm definitely going to have you back and, and chat a little bit more, but with that awesome chatting with you and really appreciate it. See you, Brian. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Backtable Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable Innovation is produced and hosted by Brian Hartley, Aaron Fritz, Diana Velasquez Pimentel, and Eric Yamaker. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Willie Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.